What's up, guys? <laughs> Welcome back to the weekly. The scraps. weekly scraps. You already know what it is, my boy. You already know. Stop playing with me. Holla at your boy AljamainSterling.com. Go, Aljamain go get yourself a fitting. Go get yourself a dad hat. Go get yourself all that. Mm. Did you like my little? Nah, that was me. weird. <laughs> that was up there with the type of stuff that I do. Yeah, I was trying to give you a taste of your own medicine. It was okay. It wasn't bad. Nerd, um, nerd focus? We got a little nerd focus action. As always, guys, you know this podcast is powered by nerd focus. Stop playing. If you haven't tried it yet, go try it. This is calories, zero calories. This is my favorite guy, especially right now because Sean said he's eating all these big meals and I can't eat yeah, as what? much of bigger meals as he can eat. What bro, was that about? You think he, that, that's his shit talk, bro? He's trying to it's get a, in your head with that. It's a sad shit talk. And if this is what we've come to <laughs> from Conor McGregor reincarnated, oh my goodness, someone please save us all. Dude, save us. you put out like a video like trashing his entire existence as a fighter. And, and then his no response way. was, I just had a big meal. What'd you eat? <sighs> Can't make this up. Do you think he's intimidated? I think he's afraid. I'm going to give you guys the goods right now. Let's go. I think Sean jumped into my cage barking and bit off more than he can chew. And that's my honest assessment. I think now he's kind of nervous about having to eat his own words so he doesn't want to say anything that he's going to actually regret saying because he thinks yeah. people are going to make fun of him, um, comment on his page. You see me, I'm the type of brother, I don't give a shit. I'm going to stand by how I feel. I'm going to say what I say and because I feel it from the heart, not because I'm just saying it just to say it. And on top of that, it's because I'm from Long Island and I just like to have a little bit of fun. Let's raise the stakes. You want to talk shit? Come to my octagon. You want to talk shit? Back it up. Have you had fights where you didn't talk any shit and then you won? Is any fights that I did not talk shit. Because um, I'm getting, I have like a major, I have a thing I'm getting at, so... I don't have any fight that I can remember off the top of my head where I was like overly respectful and didn't talk any crap at all. Like not like even what about, subtle. What about Corey? Like I feel like did you talk shit to Corey? Ah, uh, so Corey, I didn't really talk smack about Corey. The only thing I said was kind of like, oh, they're acting like he's the next coming of Moses or Jesus, something like that. Moses. Some, something along those lines. Like they make it seem like he could walk on water. That was the most trash yeah. talk i said about Corey. so uh, not okay is that really trash talk not really i feel like that doesn't like raise the stakes you saying you know what i'm saying where it's like you're putting your money where your mouth like i feel like you didn't like say anything too risky but yeah. like i guess what i'm getting at is like when you beat him does it or like and then you beat someone where you're talking a lot of smack is there a difference in how good it feels or is it just kind of like it's still a win it's just a win man i mean I, I like the banter because it just makes it more fun. There's like we could watch all these fights, and if there's nothing really to gravitate to because there's no storyline, then who really gives a shit? I could go watch a fight at the bar, you know. When the, I watch MMA because I'm intrinsically like motivated to want to learn more. I love the sport. I'm infatuated with things from the sport, but there's nothing about it where I'm just like I'm just watching it just to watch it. Like if I didn't have the need or desire to want to watch it. There'll be nothing really exciting about a lot of these fights, in my personal opinion, because they're just fights. They're just regular. Like, yeah. like, I feel that's the problem with MMA today. And I know people are going to say, well, the sport's supposed to be about respect. You're not supposed to talk trash. Shut up, dude. <laughs> Shut, please just it's not go that, with it. I mean, that would just be a way worse business model. A way worse. Like, what are we talking about? Like, we are talking about the human anatomy of fighting is in our DNA. Like, we literally come from middle school, elementary school, high school, all these places where we have altercations, and everyone loves the storyline. Even if they don't want the drama, they're here for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just something about the human nature just like, ooh, you're going to let him say that? You can't let him just say that. But that's the New York Uniondale in you, too. I, like, I, I don't have that, like, instinct because I grew up in the nice suburbs. There wasn't a lot of violence. Shy town just outside of Chi town <laughs> but like there was fights and there was kids who would get in trouble but like not very often and, it, and there wasn't like this like big culture of like fighting where you gotta like back up your words and if someone says shit to you you can't let them get away with it so you guys never talk trash to each other no nah, we were like very like fluffy and cushy like we didn't like we were like not violent or anything. So no fights. Nah, like some. Like at the school. Some, but then the co here. the police would like come in and tackle them, and it was like a big spectacle. So, 
you guys never had situations where someone said something in class and you kind of had to answer it for it and they said, come meet me in the bathroom, come meet me in the locker room. Nah, come meet me by the that playground. to us was like barbaric. Damn. That was like barbaric to us. What? Yeah. Oh. I feel like something hey. something softened between your generation <laughs> and my generation. Where I, like, I love this. Like, I remember like leaving elementary school and thinking like nobody was mean ever. And then I got to middle school and people were so mean and I was like, or it was like a little mean, but it felt like I was like, being bullied or something welcome to the real world i know and now i live with you every day where i'm harassed and hazed <laughs> so it's just he's not hazed, no guys. no he's i not i'm very happy here he's not help he's me not hazed, guys. Help, help me i would never haze anybody <laughs> all, right. all right what are you getting at jk jk um so yeah sean's trash talk is it's very mid and it, i, I want to say sub mid like subpar from mid and uh i'm not saying you have to go and be loud and obnoxious but it's like you don't jump in another man's moment. Even you can say, oh, you, but you called him out, Sterling. You called him out. All I said was, sugar, where your bitch ass is at? Like, it's the Funk Master show now. He came into my octagon. This was my moment. This is my time to celebrate. I knew he was there. I saw him. I saw Umar. I saw Sanhagen. I saw all these guys as I walked to the octagon, cruising, dancing. And then I make my entrance. So I know at the end of the day, everyone wants to become a champion. And within this sport, I've said this multiple times, you have to crush another man's dreams to achieve your own. And that's ultimately what Sean wants to do. So it's almost like he was hyped up by the moment of the fight, saying, oh, it's not that good. You better look better than that. You look like shit. And then he goes crickets. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't it, say anything. It makes no sense. It's the most weird thing. It's like I, I, I'm not even trying to make two cents out of it, like trying to put too much stock into that. Because I know he's training hard. I know he's working his ass off. I know he realizes this is my opportunity to prove to the world that I am who I say I am. And it's really but up it's, to me. Bro. <laughs> I'm like, my back hurts, bro. No. At PT, I'm getting worked on my back because I'm carrying this whole division, bro. <laughs> because I'm carrying this whole division. Wait, hold on. Like, he, what is going on? He, you, between, between him and, like, making $10 million next year is you. Like, all the endorsement deals he would get if he's champion and he has a UFC belt on his waist. Yeah. If after he beats the greatest band weight of all time, allegedly. All the the money and the opportunities he gets is between him and you. Yeah. Like you are standing in the way of all that. And and I respect it. I think there's a lot riding on this. I know people are gonna say like your reputation and everything you've achieved. Listen, it's a fight game. Anyone could win by a punch's chance. And Sean is a skilled striker. We saw Connor, we saw Khabib. Great technical matchup. Khabib, when he was eventually able to get Connor down, you saw the the tide start to shift. But Connor was having his moments where he was leading the dance. And Short could do something very, very similar. And that's what happens when you're at the highest of the highest level. Everything's at stake. You put your best foot forward and making sure you have the best training camp that you could possibly have. So I'm not overlooking Sean by any means. No. But at the same time, I'm just – I'm more annoyed that you you kind of made a whole – spectacle and hoopla out of my moment post fight like i know bill's the next fight but you you made a whole ass out of yourself and turned it into a wwe show after my fight and then so you do that you ruin my post fight speech you then ruin my vacation time and then my healing time on top of that to recover and then you take the the sneaky I, what, what word would I use to describe it? It's kind of like it's kind of a bitch way to try to jump into a title fight, knowing that your your opponent might be coming in a slightly yeah, um, not their best. I would just say I would use those terms for compromised opponents. potentially. Yes. Yeah. Um, hoping for them to be um compromised to the point where they can't train as much because let's call it what it is. That's realistically what happened. That's it's that's their words training. too. Huh? Like they they that's their words. That's not you like assuming. Yes, that's exactly they, what Tim, his, Tim said Wilson. that on the podcast. Like that's kind of something they expect is you're gonna you're gonna be compromised. Coming come in and still banged up. He has to cut a whole lot of weight again, and it's just like that's this is who you guys want as your king. Th these guys. And it's funny because he said he's the next Conor McGregor. He was like, there's there's a hole that Conor McGregor left in the game, and there's someone that needs to fill it. And he said, I think I'm that guy. I I was trying to find that clip, but there it wasn't clipped out anywhere. Yeah. But he I, said I he it. said that, and then now he's Connor would never have a title fight. And Connor not, wouldn't. Ne Connor's next fight isn't a title fight, and you you know he he's already promoting it. He's doing stuff to promote this fight. He did the Ultimate Fighter. You know when the fight gets announced, he's never gonna get off Twitter. 
Like yeah. that's a real. That's what Conor McGregor is. That Sean is not talking at all. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very different. And I'm not saying he's always the biggest talker. Like he makes those clown videos where he go like, if you get into a bar fight, this is what you want to do. You want to push, get away, create space. You want to hit him with the Superman punch, duck all the way down, hit him with the right hand, bend down, come up with the knee, and then chin check. And then he'll do stuff. like little goofy stuff. And it, some of it's actually funny, but I just don't get. I'm like, do I need to dye my hair, tattoo my face, for for the younger generation to be like, oh, he's cool. No, like, because I don't, I don't get it. You don't have to do all that because when you beat him, you steal all that clout. But you didn't have to like hoe yourself out for that. Yeah, you know? my, it's not. I'm not knocking him. What I'm saying is, it's fascinating that he resonates with so many younger folks. Um, but when you ask about like the the mainstream fans, they know about him, but everyone says the same thing. They don't think he's that good. They don't think he really won his last fight. So that narrative, I think for him, kind of bothers him. And I think he almost wants to get this win badly to the point where he's gone radio silent. And maybe that's better for him. Maybe he's in his own head. Maybe I'm in his head living rent-free right now. And we're going to find out in four short weeks. So this shit's going to fly by really, really quick. And I'm excited for this moment. Like, sometimes I don't even feel like it's real. Like, I said the same thing about Henry Cejudo. I was like... I don't feel like the guy's back until we're like out from fight week. And when yeah. I actually saw him fight week, I was like, oh, this is actually happening. Yeah, something, something about it, like, yeah, it doesn't feel real yeah. in a way. So I got to almost train hoping and pretending that this man may show up. And I'm not just, again, I'm not just talking shit. You guys know me already. Like, I'm as honest as I come in terms of uh, keeping it real with my analysis, keeping it real with how I feel about certain people, sometimes a little bit too much where it ends up biting me in the ass. Um, with my bosses, but I, I'm just very, very perplexed by Sean's approach to this fight and training camp. But if it helps him perform better, great. Because at the end of the day, I still think I'm gonna smash this guy. 100%. Um, but that's just my personal belief. Like I had to make a lot of tweaks and changes in my training just to make sure I stayed healthy and not bang up myself even more than, um, more than I would because I would running myself through a wall but i've been able to find that happy balance where i could run myself through a wall but still be smart about the things that i'm doing so i don't make older injuries um take longer to heal which would slow down the amount of high impact training that i could do so it's just kind of like making adjustments and i think yeah. at my experience level being able to compete at the highest level for such a long time um against all these top 10 competition top 5 top 15 it's given me more time to really dive into that space and, and properly prepare, going through the ups and downs, knowing what I did too much of before and it helped me, it made me lose. And then knowing what's my strengths and fighting away from my strengths, which made me also lose. So I've learned a lot of lessons that I think Sean has yet to learn. And it's up to me on August 19th to teach him those valuable lessons that may possibly one day make him a champion. But August 19th, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to have to just remind you that you're just gonna cock block him from the well, title yeah, we're just not the same it's like Matumbo not today <laughs> get that shit out of here Tom Aspinall called out John Jones and I said we we just put this on YouTube we did the reaction yeah. I, you could hear me say I think Tom's the most skilled heavyweight besides John Jones like it's them two I think all around all around skill set because like Tom can grapple he's not, I think Tom's better Probably better. Probably boxing. better at jujitsu. <clears throat> seemingly better on the feet, especially at that weight class. Tom's not a better jujitsu guy than John. You don't think? Nah. John, see, there's a difference. Because I was gonna say John's definitely the better wrestler, but I don't know who's like the better. And that's what makes jiu John's jujitsu better, in my opinion. So like you're saying, just pure jujitsu. Pure jujitsu. John's better or overall grappling? <clears throat> um, both. Okay. I think they had a grappling match. I think John's wrestling. On the ground, of like no punches, no elbows allowed. I think John's length with his arms, his reach advantage. I think his craftiness and his ability to scramble would ultimately help him win a jiu-jitsu match over Tom Aspinall. And that's respect to Aspinall's skills based on what I've seen Aspinall yeah. do in the octagon versus what I've seen John do over the years. Um, it's just, I just think it's different. Yeah, I just looked it up. John's <clears throat> reach is 84 and a half and, yes, and Tom's is, is 78. 
Yeah, John's has the long. It's so like John has the physical gifts against <clears throat> even Tom Aspinall. Yeah, it's crazy. Like he's like literally a specimen of a human. Like his body is just yeah. Him and his brothers. It's crazy. You know they're a rare breed of a family looking like that. Everyone is just a beast of a guy of a man. Like I think Aspinall will give him a really good fight. I think it will pose his challenges. But John is such a smart guy. Whereas, like, he knows how to pick his paths of least resistance. And I think him and being in all these championship fights, and obviously it's a fight, heavyweight, it only takes one shot. But the way Aspinall moves, I'm just saying in a grappling situation, what you're saying. If it's like. If it was a straight up grappling yeah. match, like jujitsu. Like of ADI, course, of course. I would say John's, I, I take John all day. John's winning that. But I'm saying, like, if you look at, like, at, I feel like at light heavyweight, John could do whatever he wanted to anybody in any domain of MMA. Just because of like it seems, I feel like he did do that. He has some. He has John has some tough fights. Yeah, but like overall, like he didn't lose. Like he beat everybody all kinds of different ways. Yeah, and he was like, even if there there might have been somebody he faced that was better in one area, but like he was better in the other areas. See, I think that's what John does better than most guys. His ability to to mix it up as a mixed martial artist, like. Gustafsson, better boxer. Um, Glover Teixeira, better boxer. Uh, Vito Belfort, on paper, a better jiu-jitsu guy, but John submitted him. Almost got cornered on bar. That's what I'm saying. His, like... his resilience and toughness and heart pulled him through, even breaking his toe against Chelsea. It's like he's been in all these tough challenges and it's kind of walked through the fire. And, I mean, there was two fights I thought that he arguably lost <clears throat> or you can make a case for a draw. And that was the Gustafsson fight, the first one, and then the fight with Dominic Reyes, where I, every time I watch it and I go back and forth and I'm just like, John, John's my guy. So I'm mm -hmm. kind of like, I have to, I almost it's feel hard, like I have yeah. to side with him. But I'm looking at him like, it's kind of a chance, you could, it's kind of an argument you can make that he actually lost this fight. Respectfully. Yeah. Of course. I think the Aspinall fight is compelling because he's pretty all, like he's all around really good, like in multiple compartments. Yeah. He's got that Cyril Gaon, like light on his feet feel it almost looks like they almost look like they fight the same on the feet except but Cyril Gaon has more kicks more kicks he'll throw that like crescent front kick that lead leg teep where Aspinall would just step in pop 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 light you up with the hands yeah I think he, he's really good like man. I was like you 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 said you've broken down John style and it's like when he's striking it's like it's not combos really it's like just like simple attacks yeah and I'm gonna give you what what I see when I watch John Jones is when guys are pressuring him and they're coming forward and they're looking tough and mean, like they want to hurt him, obviously it's a fight. And, you know, I think John does a great job of, you know, watching his opponents, good eyes, good reads. And he finds like the in-betweens where he lulls guys to sleep a little bit with his range because he's got such long-ass arms and he could trap you, hand fight with you. Then he'll throw the spinning elbows. He'll throw the side leg oblique kicks. And then they kind of come out of every um, nowhere where it's like one shot at a time and then he keeps chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. He's not the most explosive guy. He's not the most powerful guy. It's his IQ where he uses his physical gifts to outsmart his opponents. And for me, that's what wins him the fights. So like with Tom Aspinall, he's, he's an actual heavyweight and he's probably the most all-around skilled guy at the division, do you think he has, stands a chance against John to actually beat him? I mean, everyone's got to punch his chance, especially at heavyweight. Or I guess a better question would be what what are his chances and like how what, how, what would his path to victory be? Because, of course, everyone has a chance. Yeah, his path to victory for Aspinall? So you don't think it's that pot? You don't think it's like... You think John's I the think it's favorite a, in that? I think it's a good challenge. For John. For John. Whether or not Aspinall has the goods to get it done, it's it's one thing when you watch another. It's like Volkanovski. We just watched him against Yair Rodriguez, who looked brilliant and masterful against Josh Emmett. Um, this short stint that we've seen with Ortega, how well he looked against Holloway, and some of the other guys. And then he goes in there with Volkanovski, and then he, Volkanovski – tells you right before the fight he goes the guy standing in front of him mate they ain't me they ain't me and what happened it's that's what that's that's what gets us so excited about the fights is like we see things and we see people how they perform and how they do things and you you kind of get those moments where you're like maybe this could be the guy that can make this interesting 
and give us that challenge that we're kind of hoping for, or looking for from yeah. a fighter against this guy. But there's levels. But there's levels, man. And uh, I, I, I'm very much interested to see how that fight goes. But it's like betting against Mayweather when it comes to Volkanovski and it comes to John Jones. It's like you don't bet against Money Mayweather. No. It's like how many but times like, can you do that before you go broke and you realize like, hey, this guy is just IQ is just off the charts. You gotta just respect the of game. Of course, I wouldn't. I don't think I would bet against John, but I feel like it would be. It would definitely be a. It would be a back and forth fight. I think, and there's a chance Tom could win. It's always a chance. Like a sizable chance, not like a one percent. He could land a crazy <laughs> punch. Because uh, I don't know. I, I think it'd be hard to hold him down. He's like got a big jujitsu background. He's a big dude. He's got fast hands he throws good combos it's not just like a typical heavyweight yeah yeah I, I agree i just think that championship experience and then at the end of the day when it comes to grapplers you have to eventually close the distance if you want to put your hands on them and i think that's what most people have to realize like in order to land that knockout shot you almost have to put yourself in range of being taken down and with John, we saw how his striking looked against Cyril Gano on his return back after the three, after three years. It did not look good. And he said it himself. But then once he got a hold of Cyril, it was just clockwork. It's like he remembered how to ride the bike all over again. It's like, oh, it's been three years, but this feels like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those things. I think him being in all these championship fights, I think that makes it relatively, a, I don't say safe bet, but... Uh, uh, it, ma it makes it easier for me to pick John going into that type of matchup. Sure. It's uh, a good fight. I'm looking forward to it. Him, Pavlovich. I think John beats Stipe. I think he's done. I think if Stipe beats John, we get a rematch. But So John said he would fight Tom. So I, that kind of like negates he said, well, he the says, whole... He said sounds good. But at his age, his success is kind of like... I feel like once you take that long of a time of, of a break, you almost you almost one foot in, one foot out. I know he took the time off to put the size on, he was saying. But I also think there's something that comes with that break where you realize how good you have it. Um, that hunger, that desire, it's not that easy to get up in the morning and go for those early morning runs, those late night runs, those those two-a-day sessions. When the bag is... When the bag is, like, secured already. But, he, but the bag he's getting now apparently is so much bigger than like like even relative to all the bags he ever made True. it's like these are like different level bags when he's the heavyweight champion so it's like i guess look at juliana pena and amanda nunez for example okay it's like who thought that she was going to retire after that fight like who would have known and guessed that you know she, i don't think she's made any hints at that possibly being a thing other than maybe her, her and her team. Yeah, I could have seen her just being like, I'm going to keep collecting these Yeah, keep paydays, running it up. You know? yeah. Next is Juliana. I think I'm going to be her too, so let me run it up again. So I'm just saying we just don't know what the athletes are actually thinking about and what's going through that's their true. heads. Yeah. And that's what makes it interesting because I we just don't know. I mean, as a selfish fan, I would love to see John fight Aspinall. I would love to see John fight Pavlovich. I would love to see him fight Steve uh, Pavlovich would be sick. Just because he's a marauder. Yeah. But I know if John took him down, that I think that fight's over. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much anyone in that division. With John. Yeah. Yeah. Or even Aspinall, because he's good on top as well. Yeah. We seen him submit Volkov the way he did, and that was like pretty picture perfect with his technique and how clean it was. But yeah. Interesting fight. Good time for the heavyweight division. Yeah, it's it's getting crazy. Um Charles versus Islam got announced. That's official. That's in Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi. Oh, I Again. thought Charles was on vacation. I, I thought Dana said he had to check with Charles I to guess, make sure he didn't have any plans. I guess <laughs> they brought the bag. See, this is my trolling at its finest. <laughs> they brought the bag or something. Charles must have healed up. And now he's back. plans real quick. Charles says, I'm in. I lost in Abu Dhabi. I'm going to try to redeem myself in Abu Dhabi. How gangster would that be? Bro. And what if he made him wait a whole year? In front of the sheiks. <laughs> what if he made him? Bro. What if Charles Oliveira wins and it makes Islam wait an entire year to fight him again? That would be Charles crazy. Oliveira wins in front of all the Muslims, in front of the sheiks who are only there to see Islam fight, 
and Hamzat, and then makes him wait a year. Disrespectful. Gangster. Disrespectful. I th- I'm going to say this. I'll be the crazy one today. I'm saying Charles is going to get it done. <clears throat> I not too far off with you. Okay. At this point, it's, it's kind of hard for me to bet against Islam because of the way the first fight went. But to doubt Charles Oliveira would just be asinine. I think the first fight that he had with Islam, a couple of things. And you have to be unbiased in this. The fight's a fight any day, any place, any time, right? Anywhere, any place, any time. That's like the model, the, the mantra. That was the place, that was the time, and that was the place. Perspective. How many fights did Oliveira have in comparison to Islam within that calendar year? How many of them were title fights, five-round training camps? Against the best guys in the world. Yes. Where he's been dropped in almost every single one of those fights and going back to back to back in training camps. There's something about residual damage just accumulating into the next fight. Yeah. Into the next fight. Into the next fight. Especially when, yeah, if you're taking a month off between camps. Yeah. So then you see him versus Darius, and you one has to wonder, wow, how did he dispatch this guy like that, who we've been calling for to get a title shot against someone we think is very, very tough because he matches up with him very well stylistically in Darius. He goes out there. Darius was the favorite in that fight, yeah, too. And he absolutely dogged him. The guy who was supposed to be the guy to beat Islam. Yes. Just washed him, and it wasn't even close. So that's like a so that's my argument is that's an Islam that's recovered and healthy and had time to chill before that training camp. Yeah, and I when I look at that, it makes me wonder how much of the moment and all the hype that he's heard from everyone going into that fight kind of get into his head, mm-hmm. and maybe you make him fight outside of himself. And I'm not making excuses for Oliveira. I'm just saying this is something we have to think about based on the performances that we saw on that night versus the performance that, that we saw against Dariush and all his other performances before that. It makes you wonder, why did he look... And it's the same thing I said about myself and Peter Young. I go, guys, when have I ever looked that awful in a fight? When? And if you could go back to another moment where I looked that bad, okay, it was either off night or I'm really just not that good. And this other guy is Zeus. <laughs> um, and then we have the rematch and it's a completely different fight. So now I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is a very similar situation where it's not the same fight, but we can't ignore the fact of what Islam did to him in that. And I think when you look at it like that, it, it makes it kind of tough to just to go against the one that's proven in in uh, Islam Makachev. But I think it, it gives you a rightful argument to make why that fight went like that to begin with. And that's what's the most exciting part about this matchup for me. Yeah. And the like... Rematch for me. Islam's coming off a fight that a lot of people think he lost against a way smaller guy than Charles. Yeah. And then you look at Charles's last performance and you, and you think, oh, wow, he, this is a recovered guy. What does healthy Charles look like against Islam, yes. who who fought a smaller guy and and beat him by a hair, and who's not nearly the grappler that Charles is? If he gets to your back now, that. and I want to play like what if like if Char- if Islam doesn't land that shot, which I I don't I don't know if it's fair to say a lucky shot, but it was definitely like a rare knockout punch from Islam Makachev on who Charles. I mean, Charles gets dropped almost every fight. I was shocked he didn't get dropped in, against Darius, to be honest. That's true. That's a good point. But I'm like, it's... it's That's re- me siding with Islam, guys. Yeah. That is me siding. So my Muslim brothers, don't come and try to crucify me and call me a Muslim hater because I'm not. All my brothers, I got a lot of brothers and sisters that are Muslim. So please do not try to use that angle because it's not true. I don't know. I just think there's a there's a much bigger chance that 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 doesn't happen again. You know, it's not like Islam mauled him on the ground. I mean, he caught him and then when he was stunned, he choked him out. Yes. I don't see that happening again. And a lot of people were saying that he mauled him. Guys, the definition of maul, if I take you down, you could do absolutely nothing. You don't recover guard, you don't recover half guard, and you don't take any damage. That's not 
that's not mauling. If I could do any of those things and suppress the damage I take from the bottom position, there's no way you could consider that a mauling. A mauling is what Khabib did to a lot of guys. Khabib versus Michael Johnson. Khabib versus Kevin Lee. Um, Islam versus, you could even say Tiago Moises. Uh, and even that was, it was like a mauling, but not really. Islam versus Dan Hooker. That was a one-sided mauling. Like, those are mauls. But that fight was not a mauling. No. Like, we got to be honest here and stop being so biased. If yeah. you get up, if someone takes you down and then you get up, like, within a short amount of time, that's not mauling. Yes. You didn't get mauled. I agree. If you get held down for the whole round, there's a case to be made. Or if you're getting ground and pounded a lot, or if you get just choked out easily. But what if you keep getting up to a position, the guy keeps taking you down, but you keep fighting a position, getting up, the guy's struggling to hold you down, and you keep getting up, but somehow you manage. So like, you exert like, so much energy that you're exhausted. Just from trying to get but back up? Just from trying to get, no, just from trying to keep the guy down. But the guy gets back up. And gets to the next round. Would you say that's a mauling? I'm like, no, that's not a mauling. The guy matched your energy defensively with your offense. But you didn't do anything offensive to do damage for you to be like, you mauled me. Yeah. What, you controlled me? Unless yeah, okay. it's Marab. Yeah, you control. Well, if so Marab, Marab takes is- you down 100 times, you got mauled. Because Marab's not getting tired. Well, like, he's worn you down. It's, it's not even that. Marab could take you down 100 times, but he's also punching you and kneeing you. Like, that is a mauling versus... A guy who's just controlling you the whole time and throwing absolutely zero strikes. That's not a mauling to me. That's yeah, just like, okay. okay, you control him the whole time. That's, that doesn't scare me in the sense of a fight. Just being controlled without just damage. Just being controlled without or damage. Or submission It's not a mauling, in my personal okay, yeah, opinion. Okay, yeah, for sure. So, do you have a prediction? Uh, I don't know. This was it's It was a tough one for the first one. Islam really surprised me how fast he was able to get it done in the second round. Um, I was shocked by Charles Oliveira getting cracked like that by Islam and then how fast he tapped when he hit the ground. Obviously, he was hurt, and there could have been some other things going on that we don't know about. I don't speak Portuguese, so I don't know if he's ever talked about it, what happened in that fight. He doesn't seem like the type of person to make excuses or anything. Charles Islam was just a better guy that day, and I think that's why we fight. When people say, oh, 9 out of 10 times, I beat you, or 8 out of 10 times, this person wins, because it's a fight. We never know what's going to happen. I think with that being said, that's what makes this such a compelling matchup um, for this rematch that I'm excited about. And I can't wait to see what's going to actually happen in this. Um, and then Islam is, again, like for me, I still feel like the, the jury's still out on Islam. It really, I, and this guy, I'm just trying to be as honest as possible. When you see that fight with Volkanasi, who is, yes, one of the greatest to ever do it. But it's also the smaller man who's not a grappler. Do they have grappling in Australia? They don't have grappling in Australia. They don't have wrestling in Australia, brother. Yeah. You go from that to, to him doing that to you in that fight. Again, well-prepared, well-trained, well-coached. Great job from... That, that fight raises a lot of questions. Exactly. About how is he really like the Khabib? Exactly. Like, is he that good? Is he the next greatest lightweight of all time? And I think it's unfair if you ignore those facts. Because those are facts. Those sure. are things that cannot be disputed. You can't say, oh, he was playing around. But I did hear one thing. They did say Islam didn't have the full 24 hours to recover. I think you were telling me this. I I, I heard a rumor Allegedly. about that. This is what people like were saying. Like the rehydration was cut short because of the Australia time. time yeah. Because of the pay-per-view time uh, slot. Yeah. And this is what people were saying, why the fight was that close with him and Volkanovski to begin with. And why he got tired in that fifth round. Like but that. my counter to that would be like, well, Volk had the same thing. Yes. Any but, place, anywhere, anytime. Yeah. So you can't make that excuse. And then when people say this about Charles, like legitimate thing that we all saw how many fights he's had, and then say you can't use that excuse. It's just like, all right, what are we doing? What are we actually doing? It's, it's good for one guy, but not good enough for the next. We gotta. I think we got to be a little less biased here. I'm saying Charles by KO. Mm. No disrespect to Islam. I just feel like... I could see him kind of having a similar fight to what Darius did. I don't know. Or what he did to Darius. I want to watch that again. It was such a beautiful thing that the, the same side head kick with Darius's one hand up and then he just followed up and, and just put the finishing touches on it. it it's a good fight, man. I, I'm excited for this because I think if anyone who deserved an automatic rematch, it should have been Charles Oliveira. He wasn't given that time. I think he probably just wanted time to reset. And I think it played out to his benefit based on what we've seen in that last fight. I think he came yeah. in a little bit more fresh, more excited to be back out there. 
Um, it wasn't like another day in the office. It was like I, I'm actually really motivated and excited to be here again. Yeah. And that that was the the cool part about that fight for me. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a prediction. I like Islam. I think when he talks shit, it, it's funny. And it's not really like shit talking. It's just him having a good time. I love it. I think it's a, it's a great thing for him to start doing and showing his personality. Yeah. And for me, that's cool to see. Um, other than that, I'm just looking forward to a great rematch. I think this is going to be just as good as Justin Gaethje and Dustin Poirier too. The rematch. Speaking of. <clears throat> Which is happening this weekend. You see 291. I'm so excited. A couple weeks away from UFC 292. That's as guaranteed of a banger as you could ever make. Like yeah. making those two guys fight each other is certified bloodbath. Or someone's getting finished. I think both of them at a different point in their careers, they're still willing to go there. But I think they're both more polished now that that fight's not going to look as much of a train wreck like it was the first time where they kind of both just came out just swinging leather and seeing who's the toughest man standing kind of thing. I think both of them are going to come in with a more technical approach. It's still going to be haymaker and, and leather being slung, like, but I think both of them are going to be a little bit more methodical in their approach. I don't think Gaethje's going to come in just winging leg kicks like he did before. I think he's going to be taking his time, using his jab, trying to measure his distance to really land those strikes and make them count. Where in the last fight, the biggest thing that he landed was the calf kicks. And I felt... Dustin did a good job of countering up top and mm -hmm. going to the body and countering up top after that and kind of even in the score versus the calf kicks where he was like, dude, he's going to kick my calf. I'm going to deal with it later in the hospital or wherever it is. Yeah, like he just like ignored the pain for a little while. Yeah, like he made peace with that. And I think when you fight a guy like that, you have to make peace with those type of things because if you don't, you're going to end up in that dark place where you're going to be so uncomfortable and not knowing like, am I really ready to go through this fire? And only you can actually answer that question. So I feel like in since that fight, I think they're both four and two. Yeah. Since that fight, they almost have the same identical record. And it's like the same guys they fought. Yeah. So, but I feel like the guy who's made the most like visible changes to his style is Gaethje. Yeah. Like he's like toned it down a lot and like become a lot more methodical. I feel like where Dustin, I feel like he still has been in like more wars and like still like, like the physique fight. Yeah, but that one he like I feel like Gaethje like took a step back from like making just like going crazy, you know? Yeah, yes. Like he, no. he put on like a more technical performance. But you know, of course, but like he, he adapted. Took some, he took some damage For in the sure. first round. Where I was just like, holy the fact that he was able to eat some of those kicks and stuff, I'm like, dude, you hit me like that. I gotta go to the trunk, brother. I gotta go to the trunk, like come back and like you stay right here. You kick me like that, bro. I'll be back one second. It is just hang tight, you know? Crazy fight. Yeah. But I feel like that fight was a good example for Gaethje. Like, he growth. Was, yeah. That one, Tony Ferguson, he showed a lot of growth, showed a lot of discipline. Yeah. Trevor Whitman takes him off of the punches. You don't have to kill every shot. Taking his time. Use the jab to get inside, lining everything up. Yeah, like, Gaethje's shown that he's, like, matured, I feel like. as it, Like, he's not just going in there to, like, brawl now. Yeah. And I don't think Dustin was like he can brawl but i don't think he was known for being like how gaethje was like a brawler nah Dustin's not i wouldn't call dustin a brawler i think he's a just a technical badass like for me the way i perceive dustin poirier is he's willing to go through that fire to put hands on you that's just that's just the best way i can explain it he's yeah go through that fire to put some hands on you real quick and with that being said I don't know. That's that's why this one's such a tough one for me to call. I, I can't really, um, because then I look at the the Dustin Poirier versus Michael Chandler fight, and Chandler had a very very good chance of winning that fight if he took home the third round. I feel like he was winning the fight, Chandler. I thought it was one one going into the third, and then but the the up until the submission he was winning the third. I felt up until the takedown where he got reversed. Yeah. Is when he was winning the fight, I thought. Yeah. And not by much. I'm not saying he was it, killing Dustin Poirier in the third round. I'm saying it was a very close fight. Dustin showed his grit, showed his fight IQ, superiority in that fight. And Chandler made one mistake 
getting overzealous with the takedown. I actually did that just this past Thursday when I hit the takedown and I hit a big takedown on Javid. Like I, I didn't need to make it all, such, such a big impactful takedown. I could have nicely put him down and then stepped over the legs and have a much easier position. But I was like, let me see what would happen just because it's training. I'm like, let me just see what would happen if I get into this position. I go, yep, exactly what I thought. You kind of lose the position within a couple of seconds. When you slam. When you slam. Because there's, there's a lot less control. Yeah. For whatever reason. And yeah. So that's what Poirier did. Used the position to his advantage, got the reversal, put on the finishing touches, and got the job done. And I think he just showed his superiority with his um, with his boxing and his just fight IQ overall. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess, did, did Gaethje, <clears throat> do you think he's improved enough to close the gap and get the win? That's why this is such a good fight, man. Yeah. I, I really can't call it. Um, and, again, I, I see all these guys all the time. And I'm never one to bet on fights, so I try not to do that. I, I only talk about the, the stuff that I see in fights and what I think can be their advantages and keys to victory. So I want to make sure I always disclose that whenever we are doing these analysis and breakdowns. Like, I think Poirier is a better boxer. I'm going to just say that straight up. I think Poirier is a better boxer than Gaethje. I think Gaethje might hit harder than Poirier because the way he sits into all his punches, I think he hits harder. That's just my personal opinion. Um... I think Dustin's a little bit more accurate. But again, I think Gaethje has shown the growth, like you were saying, in his pe previous um, fights that he's had of late. And that could also prove to be a difference in this fight as well from the first fight. Yeah, I, I don't know how to predict it. And um, this, the cool thing about this fight is it's in Salt Lake City, UFC 291, um, the rematch, Dustin Gaethje versus... Dustin Poirier, too. This is going to be a great fight. And I partnered up with DraftKings to let you guys know, if you use my promo code ALJO and bet just $5, you can win $150 in bonus bets. And guess what? You get it instantly. Instantly, No people. way. Instantly. Instantly. No cap. I can confirm because I did it. Yes. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. Ah. I used your code. Got $125. What? $120? I got this one's one hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, in, I got in bonus. I got six twenty five dollar free bets, and I made money. In bonus bets. Yeah, Let's it's see. like, but they break it up into like six twenty five dollar bonus bets. Fret, yeah. Let's see. That's what's up, guys. It's sick. So I'm just saying, if you wanna, you know, go out there and test your luck, see, put my knowledge to the test. Go out there and use these bonus bets. Use my promo code Aljo. Tell them I sent you. You download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now, and go go collect them dollar dollar bills, yo. Code Aljo. Um, Cheers. Code Aljos. Yahtzee. Nerd focus. Um, speaking of UFC 291, is it 291? Yeah. Yeah. So the next fight is also a title fight. It's Pahovic versus Pajera for the UFC light heavyweight title. Um, I have no idea how that fight's going to go. Me either. You look at Pahovic's last fight with Ankalaev, and that fight was just weird. <laughs> But we know one thing. I can confirm that Blahovich has shins of steel. The way he was just kicking Ankalaev's leg. If another man is willing to go shin to shin with you and just kick your shin, doesn't care if you check it or not, run. Dude. <laughs> that ain't making no sense, bro. Also, like, I saw a compilation on TikTok of Blahovich's leg kicks on Ankalaev. It's like they knock you over. Yeah. Like, they collide with you like a train. These aren't regular leg kicks. Yeah. I'm interested to try that with Sean. Interesting. To go shin to shin and see whose whose calves are smaller. His are like this who's thing. Who's a more razor shop? I can fit my nose. Probably. Give me your ankle. I, um, I my my question is like, can Pereira's power translate up to a guy like Jan Blahovich? Yeah, I like, think the way he sits into his punches, I think having the body weight behind him, not having to cut down as much, could be to his benefit, and. I think when you know how to punch, you know how to punch, man. He's not the most technical boxer. We've seen these videos floating around on YouTube on my Explore page. Seeing clips of him boxing, like the guy hit, popping him with the jab, popping him with the jab. And then he just puts on these left hooks that we've seen him sleep many a people with. And it's just nasty. Yeah. It's just if he hits you, man, it's just like these guys just go down. But he's also fighting a guy that puts people down with the Polish power. Yeah. But we also saw his last fight, which was a real really weird one to watch which one angle live that fight yeah that was a weird one that was a really weird fight a draw um i'm not saying anyone won or should have lost but it was just a weird fight and when you have a guy who hits the way that Pereira hits 
I don't think he's looking to come to grapple. I think he's looking to take Blahovich's head off like he does just about everyone that he comes in there to fight. But, like, I feel like Blahovich could do to Pereira what he did to Izzy to secure the fight. Because there's probably... Oh, with the grappling? Yeah, like, just take him down hold him. Like, there's always that that he could do. Yes. But here's my thing. I think Pereira is a bigger man than Izzy is. I think we all seen that when they stood next to each other in, in the octagon. But, like, I'm bigger than you, but you could still take me down very easily because you know how to wrestle, and I have zero, res- like, wrestling at all. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure he's putting in some time. I mean, after all these years with Glover, I'm sure Glover can walk him through some of those positions. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But it's it's also, Glover's not really a wrestler. He's not. So it's like. But he's got good jiu-jitsu. Knows yeah. how to use his guard, knows how to use butterfly guard, knows how to sweep guys. Yeah, maybe he taught him how to get up and stuff. Yeah, but it's not like he's gonna be teaching him like how to really beautifully defend a takedown or. And I gotta watch that Izzy fight again with Blahovich because I think he held him down and Izzy didn't really do too much to get back to his feet. Where I think Pajeda might be a little bit more active if he gets taken down. I think that could be the difference. I'm not saying he could hold him down the way he held down Izzy, but there's also a chance that if he's a true 85er, that Blahovich might just be a bigger man. But I know Pajeda has a huge head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big ass fist, and he's got a really good jujitsu guy in his corner, and Glover Teixeira, former champion. I think that makes everything very interesting to see what type of work. If I'm them, I'm looking at the Izzy fight, seeing what Izzy did wrong, why he couldn't get up, looking at those positions that he held him in, and reviewing those positions. And I'm rinsing and repeating, rinsing and repeating, even if it's not live, live drill, live drill, and just getting those reps in day in and day out to make sure that you're improving in those positions. I'm not saying you got to do it every single day, but at least three, four times a week. I think that's going to help you catapult that uh, experience and comfortability in those sequences where if you get there, you're going to be like, oh, I feel like I've done this a million times already. For sure. Um, if if Pereira does beat Jan, does that warrant a fight with Izzy to come up? Like does Izzy does Izzy have to go up and because it's like another one up like Izzy couldn't get the two hundred five <laughs> title but Pereira could against the guy who beat Izzy at two hundred five. You know why it's funny because it reminds me of that picture. Um, they're like uh, Pereira is golfing now. Then no, um, Izzy's golfing now. Pereira shows up on the golf course like hey, anything you do, I can do better kind of thing. Yeah, like he goes everywhere Izzy goes. Yeah, because uh, that would be like that would be like I'd be a little annoyed. But you ha- you kind of have to go. I'd be a little annoyed, though. Because somehow this became a title fight. Where it's like, Blo- Pereira could do what Izzy couldn't do against the guy who stopped Izzy from doing it. So now I got to go fight this man at 205, where, he d- where he's not cutting yeah. 1,000 pounds. What happens when he hits me at that weight class? Oh, That's my God. I'm like, different. But, like, people will call for that fight. They would. Yeah, that's why I love MMA, man. It's this, crazy. This a crazy ass sport. The possibilities and the what ifs are just they're never ending. I don't know. I, I'm here for it. If it happens, it happens. Ooh, we early predictions. That. Izzy versus Strong uh Sean Strickland. While we're on while we're on Izzy. Oh this is a strange one because of how it came together. You go from Duplessis and him in the cage saying if you had gloves on, we could do it right here, right now, to now, Duplessis said, whatever happened, something that forgot what was hurting is either his ankle or his knee or his foot, whatever. It's interesting how in a fight that goes only two rounds, he's banged up like that. And I'm just, ah, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm trolling, guys. Can we, I'm not, trolling. can we not get in trouble for one week? Um, it's interesting to see that. And then he's no longer in the fight. They were trying to do it in Sydney, Australia. That would have been great. That's happening in September. Hopefully, I'm going to be there. So after this fight with Sean, hopefully everything goes well. I plan to go to the UFC Paris. And after that, we plan to go to um, possibly to Singapore. If not going to Singapore, we're going to go to Bali. Go hang out to Bali. Go meet my guys over there at the gym, Bali MMA. Um, get some training in. Get some surfing in. And then make our way over to Australia and go watch the fights there. Be a guest fighter. And maybe go hang out with some kangaroos and some koalas. That's going to be a good time. So that's like my vacation to myself after doing true hard training camps back to back. Um, I think regardless of the result, this is um, a good time coming for my fiance and I. And possibly Jake. He might be, you know, he might be I might, the third I might, wheel. I might pull up to some <laughs> of it. But but uh, 
So wait, are they gonna? F- is that the thing they're gonna fight they're in Australia? To fight in Australia. So Strickland getting a title fight against Izzy is, is so fun to me. It's, it's just comedy. Because just the press the conference. Talk. It's gonna I be epic, Nilla. dude. I love Sean Strickland. Might be one of the most entertaining personalities in yeah. the sport right now. Yeah, he is. He definitely is. He's more entertaining than your Sean. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm very much looking forward to that fight. That's good. this should be a very interesting one to see how these two lock it up. Uh, I do think, I think Sean's technical ability, where he doesn't really kick, primarily boxes. I think it might hurt him because Izzy's going to be looking to chop down the calf, body kicks, faints, 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 question mark kicks, looking down, coming up, looking down, one two, looking down the uppercuts. He has a good diversity of attacks that makes him very, very tricky. And it's going to be overloading the sensory system of Sean Strickland. I think Sean's going to make sure he's, he needs to prepare in such a way. He's fighting one of the all-time greatest right now in the middleweight division, in my personal opinion. I think he's one of the best to ever do it behind Anderson Silva, maybe behind Weidman, or maybe now above Weidman in terms of defenses. Sure, yeah. And in terms of craftiness, youth still. Um, storylines like there's just everything about a champion that you want this man has it in Izzy yeah. so I'm very intrigued to see what Strickland's approach is going to be and how he's going to handle the diversity of the attacks of a guy like Izzy and who in the gym is going to be able to mimic or give him those type of looks like, they're definitely going to have to bring somebody in maybe a couple of bodies Strickland has a gas tank. I think that's one area that can actually help him in this fight against Izzy. Um, I think it's a tough fight, and uh, I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. This is a great opportunity for Sean Strickland to elevate his profile even more. And we all know he's about doing the man dance. Ah! So we'll see what happens in this one. If he's going to do the man dance with a guy like Izzy. Yeah, I think Izzy's definitely the favorite, but... I don't know. Sean seems to have a way. He just keeps winning. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the fight. Things going to be good. Um, Definitely. Any other? I might go to UFC, UFC Nashville. I'm on the side. I'm on the fence about it. What's that like? August 5th. I'm thinking to go there, promote the fight, maybe take some pictures with the fans, um, watch O'Day, watch Corey Sanhagen versus Rob Font, main event. And I take my ass right back home to Long Island. Um, That'd be fun. Rest up on Sunday, get ready for training, feeling the fire of the bantamweight division getting lit up again with a, a shakeup in the division, possibly, or some movement in the division. So there's a there's a lot going on right now. Um, I'm undecided. I'm gonna see what I'm gonna do, what we're gonna do. It would be cool. Definitely. I just I I get to a point where I get to these training camps where I, I want to make sure I'm not doing too much. Where I'm like, am I traveling too much? Am I make? Am I doing more than I really should be doing? And sometimes that's like the hard part for me to battle with. And uh, I think as long as I get my work in, if I fly in Saturday because it's on the same coast, I could train, get my my training in then, or fly in and fly back home and get my training on Sunday to start the week, and then go back home. So I don't know. The, a couple of logistics I got to figure out to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Sure. And not make it seem like I get in my own head sometimes. Sometimes I just don't want to feel like I'm taking the challenge lightly. That's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah. As long as you work. Yeah. As long as the work gets put in, then nothing matter. You see it. Is that I it? Go. Yes, I think that is it, guys. We got the Funk Harbor coming soon. Hopefully, got the bottles in hand. Um, I was looking like August 9th or August 10th, I should have some sample bottles. Hopefully, we get the approval to go to with the TDB, I think it's called, um, for online sales. This is going to be a limited edition, guys. So when it comes out, make sure you put those orders in. I'm trying to see if we can do a pre-order because pre-orders will be a lot easier to make sure everyone can kind of secure their their bottle. Um, I'll let you guys know. I'm going to figure out with these guys this week um, some more of the logistical details on that before... We figure, I guess before we figure out everything else, these guys are coming over from the UK with the bottles, and I'm just very excited to let the world taste this 
and introduce them that rum is not just for the island and the vacation, man. It's an everyday drink, man. It's one of the one of my favorite choices of spirits to have. Drinking it right now. That's the that's one of the simple bottles. Yeah, on the rocks, no chaser. I didn't ask. Very good. Yeah, I'm just this drinking is, my nerd focus. This is my stuff. Um, other than that, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I dropped a couple comments for the last pod that we did, the reactions that we did yesterday. Uh, I hope you guys, if you like this shit, subscribe to this shit. You'll hit the spinning back fish. Pow, pow, pow. Oh, also, yeah. subscribe to the weekly, the weekly scraps. Check out that. The weekly scraps is going to be posting a lot of the clips. Um, we're two subscribers away from getting monetized. Oh, even better. Actually, now we're one. One subscriber away. So go subscribe to the weekly scraps media on YouTube, and then we can make more money. As a team. Team effort. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're coming up on the fifth anniversary for this show, too, in December. Wow. I want to try to do, I want to do something cool for that. So we'll That'll see. That would be dope. Yeah, it's when after Al fought Kevin Lee and he won. I think I started the podcast like the week after. Like, did you interview him or something? No, nah, nah. Oh, okay. Just talked about the fight. Bro, we could definitely do something huge for that. Yeah, and next, I wanna, I'm going to bring on Jason Griggs. I spoke to him earlier today. Came nice. to the house. And we're going to do a real estate podcast to give you guys some ins and outs some things that you could do if you're looking to airbnb cash flows type of scenarios um long-term holes uh, short-term holes short-term rentals all those type of things that you're looking to do um possibly in your area or possibly here in las vegas so i can't wait to bring jason griggs on he sold me my house here in vegas he sold marab his house here in vegas and so a couple of my other friends houses here in vegas one of the best realtors out here We'll go to bat for you and uh, just an all around good guy. And of course, he's from Long Island. So, what's better than that? The goat. Um, other than that, see you guys next time. Peace.